All right. We'll start with the Shema. Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. And our blessing for our learning together. Baruch Atah Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Bachar Banu Mikol Hamim Venatan Lanu Et Torato Baruch Atah Adonai Noten HaTorah. Before we start, I'll just say I was working with Deb Flomberg and Alex in the Jewish Experience office to plan our get together for when I come to Denver. So just to mark your calendars for Thursday, September 19th. And it's uh, we have a whole program planned from 10 until 2 um, that day, starting off with um, coffee and meet and greet and hug and kiss and talk and schmooze. And then I'll give a class um, from, from 11 to 12. And then after that, um, Chef Cheryl Lieban is going to prepare uh, luncheon for us, which is complimentary. I am looking for anybody who would like to be an angel sponsor of the event to help um, underwrite the costs of the luncheon. But we didn't wanna have any barriers to entry because we'd really like to have everybody anybody who's able to come to come and join in and that we will be able to have uh, lunch together and still talk and schmooze and for people to see each other as well. And also for people to get to meet Gila Ross, if you haven't yet met her, because she's wonderful and she's, of course, uh, newly in charge of the women's experience that she's in charge of the women's programming. So that's what's coming up, and uh, Deb just made my flyer for me, so you'll be seeing it and getting it, and I hope that whoever's in town will be able to come by for as much of it as you can. So looking forward to it, and now that um, we're into well into August, uh, it's it'll be very soon. Yes, Andy. What time did you say your class starts? The morning will be from 10 o'clock until 2, 10 to 11 to say hello to everybody. And then the class will start at 11 to 12. Thank you. And then we'll have lunch afterwards together. I just didn't want to, after not seeing people for two years, have people walk in and sit down for a class. I thought that was probably not going to work for anybody, least of all me. So, okay. <clears throat> all right. This Shabbos is called Shabbat Hazon. Shabbat Hazon means the Shabbos of vision. And it's based on the Haftorah for this week. It is always the Haftorah, the Shabbos that precedes Tisha B'Av, is Shabbat Chazon. And so we're going to take a look at it for a moment. And it's in the back of your Chumash. And hold on, let me get the, the page here. It's the Haftorah for Parshat Devarim. And one sec. Of it. Come on, it's we're beginning the, the book of Devarim, the, the book of Deuteronomy on page 1195 in the back of your Chumash. That's where all the Haftorahs are. 1195. What we're going to see here is the opening here. It's chapter one of Isaiah, Chazon Yeshayahu ben Amotz, the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amotz. Isaiah was a person who was the, his uh, book of Isaiah, which actually we're now learning in Nachiomi is the book of Ishayahu of Isaiah, has in it the a lot of the prophecies of things that are going to go wrong for the Jewish people, as well as comfort of the Jewish people. So we have both. This Shabbos, though, is a very special Shabbos of Chazon. This is, what does it mean? We just said it means a vision but it should seem a little strange to you because the word to see is the word lir ot. So like ani roa, I see something. So what does chazon mean? So chazon is actually related to another Hebrew word and that Hebrew word is chazeh. The word chazeh is a word that I use when I go to the butcher because it means breast. And so if you're looking to buy boneless breasts of chicken, you ask for chazeh. And a bra is called a chazit, just so you know, in case you want to buy one while you're here. So it means chest or breast. So the question is, why is that the word then that's based on that, that is used for the name of the Shabbos, it's called Shabbat Chazon, which is about a vision. 
So this is talking about a very special kind of vision that we are granted on this Shabbos preceding Tisha B'Av. And very interesting because we are in the three weeks and becoming progressively sadder and more down as we're getting ready to plummet to the depths of Tisha B'Av. And yet on the Shabbos right preceding Tisha B'Av, we're going to have this Shabbos of vision. What's the vision? So according to our tradition, on this Shabbos, a person who is open and makes their heart expand, which is why it's called a vision based on the chest, because inside our chest is our heart. So this is the type of vision that comes from having a heart that can see, a heart that can feel, a heart that can perceive. And what is it that we're supposed to be able to per perceive at this point that we're given a gift? It says we will be given a gift of being able to see the rebuilt Beit HaMikdash, to be able to see the rebuilt temple. So that before we go into the holiday that's going to commemorate and take us to the destruction of the temple, we have a Shabbos that comes to cushion us and give us inspiration for the future of that temple rebuilt. So we come to this vision of the third temple. And since I was looking here, almost everybody I think has been to Israel before, but you, even if you haven't and you've seen pictures, you've seen pictures of the Beit, Ham, of the Beit HaMikdash, of the, you know, of what it looked like. You can Google it. You can take yourself on a tour. Jewish people in this day and age have every ability to be able to imagine it because we have pictures. Just as an aside, you know, you probably have heard this, but the, the first group of Ethiopians who came to Israel had because they had been so disconnected and didn't have WhatsApp, didn't have cell phones, didn't have anything, they didn't know the Beit HaMikdash had been destroyed. And so they came to Israel expecting to go to Jerusalem and to go to the temple. And they were devastated to find out that it had been destroyed. Whereas we're like, yeah, like it was destroyed a couple thousand years ago. And they were just, they were devastated. So they had been holding in their mind what they had been told about the existence of the Beit HaMikdash. On Shabbat Chazon, we have the opportunity to perceive the Beit HaMikdash and to perceive also what we're missing and what it could be like. And I think this year of all years in the recent past, we know what we are missing. We know that we are not in a place of peace, that we are in exile and even in the land of Israel, that we are still in Galut. We are in have, living in exile experience, and we are missing, missing, missing the Beit HaMikdash and everything that that means. So that's what this Shabbat Chazon is about. So that's on the side of lifting us up, but it also then comes to get our attention that if we don't know that we're missing something, we have no reason to try to fix anything. If we don't know there's a problem, why would you fix anything? You just figure like, well, this is this is how this is how it is. Like it is what it is. But the vision itself, on one hand, is inspiring, and on the other hand, it brings us to greater pain because we know what we're missing. So it has that paradoxical impact on us. So this is how we're going to go into Tisha B'Av, which starts. Uh, will be at the beginning of the week on Monday night, Tuesday. Is that right? Monday night, Tuesday. So that will be on, on Tisha B'Av, the full fast. The Parsha that we are on is always, 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 no matter how the calendar works out, the Parsha is always Parsha Devarim. And that is the beginning of the book of Deuteronomy. Devarim is much better word than Deuteronomy, which always sounds like from cats or something, um, I can, you know, whatever. That's, um, there's a uh, understanding that we need to have of Parshas Devari. The word Devari means words. And the words are, begin on page 939. 939 is the beginning of the Sefer, the book of Devarim. And it starts off, Ela HaDevarim Asher Diber Moshe El Kol Yisrael. These are the words that Moshe spoke to all of Israel on the other side of the Jordan. And it was in the 40th year in the 11th month on the first of the month. When was this? Rosh Chodesh Shvat. 
He, these are his words. This is the final month. The entire book of Devarim is the final month and a week of Moshe's life. And he is speaking to the Jewish people. And these words are his, even though God ratifies them as the fifth book of the Torah, but they're really, they have a different quality to them. They're considered to be an intersection between the written Torah and the oral Torah, because it's Moshe's words too, but he is channeling God. And so it has the it has the same status at, as that. But Ela Hadvarim, these are the words that Moshe speaks to the Jewish people before he dies and what he sends them into, what he sends them off with. And in this Parsha itself is a reference to Tisha B'Av in this very strange way. We know that the book that we're going to read, the Sefer we're going to read, the Megillah that we're going to read on Tisha B'Av is called Eicha. It's translated as lamentations, but Echaz, it's also translated as woe, but it really means how can this be? It is like, how did this happen? It's based on also the word Ayeka, which means where are you? It's the phrase, it's the word that God said to Adam and Chava after eating from the tree of knowledge of good and evil, like, where are you? And he didn't mean where are you? He meant where are you? Like, what happened? So this Eicha, Ayeka, is the is a coming from the gut of like, how can this be? Well, this is so sad and so difficult and so burdensome. And the word appears already in this week's Parsha of Devarim. And where it is, is on page 943. So go a few pages into the Parsha. And Moshe is reviewing his history with the Jewish people. And it says to him, he says to them in verse 12, verse 12. So this is chapter one, verse 12. How can I alone carry your contentiousness, your burdens, and your quarrels? That's what he asks for God. And he's saying this to the Jewish people. And the word is, Echa, how is it possible for me to carry? all of you, your contentiousness, your burdens, and your quarrels, because as we already found out that Moshe was told to tell Yehoshua, to tell Joshua, the Jewish people are difficult. They are quarrelsome. They are challenging. And you have to be a very special kind of leader to lead them. But the melody that is used, it's going along the regular Torah melody is, is chanted until it gets to this sentence. And this sentence that the person who is reading the Torah and knows what they're doing switches into the melody of lamentations. And it goes into the sound of the Megillah of lamentations. So the question is, what does this mean that we are so difficult? And how is this related to Tisha B'Av, when we're going to read the book of Lamentations, as it's all connected. We know that the second temple was destroyed, we're told, because of Sinat Chinam, baseless hatred, or otherwise known as hatred for free. Baseless hatred. There's not one person, I don't think, among us who would ever say that their dislikes or their quarrels with somebody were for no reason. No one would ever say, you know what, I got in a fight with somebody and it was for absolutely no reason. We always have a reason. So what's the problem? What is our problem that causes such the rifts amongst people? This is one of the things that happens is that our perceptions of other people lead us to come into more conflict than is necessary. That of course, not everybody's going to agree on things. Everybody's a person, a world unto themselves. We're not looking for everybody to think the same, have the same opinions, have the same perspective. But the respect and friendliness and camaraderie that is supposed to accompany that, we are often sorely, sorely lacking. Which I think everyone can think of in their own lives and in our community. We have a lot of work to do on this. And that this is what led to the destruction of the temple and which leads to it not being rebuilt now. So it says, what is the antidote to this? What is our challenge here? What is one of the answers to this? So I listened to a class. It was a really interesting. Did I write down his name? Um, no, I'm so sorry. I don't have his name. It was not my idea. 
but he points to a very interesting place in the Torah that we read a couple of parshas ago. When we read in Parshas Masse on page 931, let's go back a few pages. 931, this is in Parsha Masai. We read about the cities of refuge. If you remember the cities of refuge, who went there? It was a person who killed accidentally. And the reason they had to go to a city of refuge is because the family members of the person they accidentally killed really had a right to kill the person who killed their relative. And if they went to the city of refuge, that was a protected, that was a true sanctuary city. That was where they went and they had to stay there until the Kohen Gadol of that time died, which the Torah itself specifies. So it specifies it in two places. One is in verse 25, where it says the assembly shall rescue the murderer, and they don't mean the murderer, they mean the manslaughterer, from the hand of the avenger of the blood, and the assembly shall return him to a city of refuge where he had fled, and he shall dwell in it until the death of the Kohen Gadol, whom one had anointed with the sacred, sacred oil. And then again, it says in verse 28, for he must dwell in his city of refuge until the death of the Kohen Gadol, and after the death of the Kohen Gadol, the murderer shall return to the land of his possession. So first of all, you can have a whole conversation about like, what does the Kohen Gadol have to do with it? So there's two different opinions. One is that it was kind of the Kohen Gadol's fault that this person came to be a person who accidentally killed. The Kohen Gadol, who is supposed to be the master teacher of Torah and care and concern for other people and being careful if you're handling something dangerous, an example is always given of a person who's chopping wood in the forest with an ax and the ax handle flies off I'm sorry, the ax flies off from the handle and kills somebody. Well, the person clearly wasn't intending to kill anybody, but did you not check your equipment before you went into the forest cutting wood? That uh, ax is a, is a dangerous thing. So there's a culpability, but saying, well, there's something wrong with the educational system. There's something wrong with the spiritual system of the community if it allows, if it produces this kind of a person. So the Kohen Gadol was considered responsible. On the other hand, the person who committed the offense is, of course, responsible because they're the one who took the action. The Kohen Gadol is not a puppet master pulling strings, making sure that everybody makes the right decisions. We can't even make control of the decisions of small children in our homes. How am I supposed to be controlling the, the decisions and the actions of people who live in my community? But there is a connection. Now, by definition, if you know that you have to stay in your city of refuge away from your place, what are your feelings toward the Kohen Gadol? It's like, what are you praying for on a regular basis? You should be praying for the death of the Kohen Gadol because that's your ticket out. That's your parole board. You're not going anywhere until the Kohen Gadol dies. So it says people would pray for the Kohen Gadol to die. But our tradition says what happened to kind of ameliorate, kind of quiet things, settle things down. It says the mother of the Kohen Gadol would prepare pastries and treats for the people who were there, who were the manslaughterers, to just kind of, you know, let's just relax. And my son is really lovely and he should have a good long life and you don't need to be so upset. And you think like, seriously, somebody who's a, an accidental killer who's looking for the death of Kohen Gadol is gonna be bought off by, you know, a donut? It's like, that seems unlikely. It says, the truth is, it does. It just shows that this person is like, here's the Kohen Gadol's mother is coming to him. Hello, I came to see you. How are you doing? I know this is so difficult, but I have a treat for you. And the human connection. It says the gentleness, the gentleness in our interactions with people who are not good people, who are problematic people, who have caused death, have caused destruction. You could say, you know, if this person's going to be so such a flagrant person and and not pay attention, he's not he's not like my kind of person. I'm not going to spend any time with this kind of a person. Instead, of, I think this is exactly the person I need to spend some time with. And just we're not talking about the crime; we're just talking about you as a person. And that this expression of kindliness lowered the temperature, lowered the animosity, and changed the situation. 
Now, I'm assuming that in most of our lives, the people we have difficulty with are not people who are necessarily, God forbid, praying for our death and destruction amongst our friends and family members. And they're not people who have become wanton killers either. That somewhere in there, there is room for a gentle approach. And this gentle approach is what we are looking at how we can do this. So is there someone in your life where there has been friction, where there has been friction, where a phone call, a card, a cup of coffee, a little gift, a little something would just soften and smooth over. Like, I know we disagree on politics, religion, weather policy, immigration, you name it, gun control, school prayer, vouchers, you know, submit your whole list. I know we don't all agree on this, but I value you as a person and I want to connect. So we tend to think of this mostly at Purim when we are sending goodies to one another. But this time of year is also important because we're trying to heal relationships. And this doesn't mean that we have an agenda to get them to think the way we think. It doesn't mean that we have an agenda to change them into somebody we want them to be. We just want to soften the whole situation. Because if Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, who was a pretty strong person physically, emotionally, spiritually, in every way is like, Echa, how am I supposed to deal with you? He didn't say that about Pharaoh. He didn't say that about, oh, the king of Bashan. He didn't say that about the Moabites. He didn't say it about the Midianites. He didn't say that about any of the enemies. He's saying that about Jewish people. It's like, we need to relax with each other. Just relax. Any place we can insert a gentle response would be very helpful. Ah, uh, the month of Elul is for to make the phone call. We need a head start. I think we need off. Uh, we need this. And right now, especially, we have, we are in a very precarious, vulnerable situation, position. And our response is a spiritual response. Yes, the army needs to do what they need to do. Negotiators need to do what they need to do. America and our allies need to do what they need to do. But there are a whole lot of millions of other Jewish people who also have something to do. And that's something to do is to fix the core problem and shift, as I said in my email, shift the energy. We need to redirect the energy by changing our energy and our approach so that we can soften this whole situation. That is our strength. Um, I saw a rabbi, it's actually a couple who said, we're not supposed to even talk about what our enemy's plans are because that gives them that strengthens them. We are not. The people who are in charge need to talk about it. But we're not supposed to, are they going to do this? Are they going to do that? What about this? What about that? But even just the speculation, it doesn't help us. That being said, the ninth of Av has been a time when other nations throughout history have knowingly or unknowingly decided to take strong actions against us. And in this time and in this day, they all know exactly what that day is. So we have, we're in the situation that's a little bit like Haman's decree against the Jews, but we have time, not a lot of time, but we have a period of time now, now to make a difference. And the difference that we need to make is changing this equation to making this echa, to taking away the voice, to take it away from turning it from darkness to light. We have a beautiful gematria to change that echa. So echa, so the way you spell it, as you see it is aleph, yud, chaf, hey. So aleph is equal to one, yud is equal to 10, chaf is equal to 20, and hey is equal to five. So what is that all together is 36, okay? So echa equals 36. I don't know about you, but when I make donations, I often do a, a $36 donation because that's double chai. Okay, so we have Echa is double high, but it's 36 is something else. 36 is connected to another holiday where we are in a place of darkness and where we are trying to create light. 
And that holiday is the holiday of Hanukkah. Hanukkah, which takes place at the darkest time of the year, at the darkest time of the month, at a dark time of history. The only holiday that spans a Rosh Chodesh where there's no light of the moon at all. And that's when we bring in the lights. And how many candles do we light? It says over the eight days, we light 36 candles. It says, so 36 is always associated with bringing light into a place of darkness. So here we have Echa, which is darkness. And how is this possible that we have fallen into this trap once again or still? And at the same time, it's like, if one is in this place, this is the very place where even a little bit of light, a little bit of light will illuminate tremendously. If you're someplace where there is already a lot of light, so you light your little candle, no one's going to see it. But like someone said, like with the power being out, if the power is ever out and you even have just one little candle, it's amazing. You can actually light up your room and you can see. So this time of Echa, this time of 36-ness is on one hand, Echa, how is this possible? And on the other hand, if I have a little bit of light and the light is not a bonfire, it's a small amount of light that each and every one of us is capable of giving and capable of doing. Questions about that before we go to part two? Patricia. So how do we, how do we manifest? I mean, what do we do to manifest this light in this time of time? Of light. So it's in our personal relationships. It is the, the, so the light and you can use it a number of different ways. So there is the light of Torah. So learning Torah enhances light. Teaching Torah enhances light. Living Torah enhances light. Anything that our own self-illumination through our own spiritual growth also increases our own light. It's like changing the lampshade. It's like our neshamas are all light all the time, but our lives may be a black lampshade over the, over the bulb. So making that more and more translucent and removing the barrier will allow our light to already shine. We don't have to go get the light. We need to reveal the light that's already there. And the same thing is true with our connection with other people. So we're by definition connected. That's actually part of the problem is that we're connected. People don't really fight with people they have absolutely nothing to do with. You know, you, you don't, who do you get in a fight with? You get in a fight with people who are in your life, who you are close to. In fact, that's some of the frustration is like, you're in my life, you're in my family, and look how you think. I can't believe the way you're thinking, acting, doing, saying, all of those things. That's where the frustration comes in. And the Jewish people get very aggravated with each other. Um, we just do. So anything that we can do to lower the temperature or to extend friendship, again, kind of a little bit like um, Purim, is making some sort of a friendly gesture to someone where there needs to be some softening in the relationship. And I know think, you know, people, people are very tense and nervous and polarized about all sorts of things. So it's really, really not easy. So that's what I would suggest in that way. Okay. Um, the next part here. The original Tisha B'Av. So we said that the, the destruction of the temple was the um of the second temple was caused by baseless hatred. But we also know that the first temple, it says, was uh, destroyed based on the three cardinal sins of murder and idolatry and sexual immorality. But it says the, the first Tisha B'Av went back farther. What was the first Tisha B'Av? The first Tisha B'Av was Parsha Shalach. That was when the spies came back with their evil report about the land of Israel. And it says, and they cried that night. They cried. And then it says, God said, if you're crying tonight over nothing, in the future, you're going to really cry over something. Because what we cry over tells us what is important and what our priorities really are. 
So we judge people by what they cry over because a cry is something that takes over our whole our whole being, which is why you don't talk logic to somebody who's crying. They're having a complete emotional experience that is total. So that when the people cry over the report and wanted to go back to Egypt and had they this whole thing and God's trying to kill them and he hates them and they got themselves all worked up based on the report from the spies, that night was Tisha B'Av. But I learned something so fascinating that said that was there something already in that day on Tisha B'Av the ninth of Av? Was there something already there that was like a crack a crack in the system that allowed that to even happen. Because you could say, what happened to the Jewish people? Like, how, how did they mess up? How did they trip on that day? How did they trip and not, and not have the right perspective and therefore the right emotions? Because people think emotions come first and then thoughts, it's the opposite. Our thoughts lead to our emotions. And if our thoughts were correct, our emotions would be correct. So the Jewish people have gotten themselves on the wrong thought Actually, I looked up, uh, was it cognitive behavioral therapy that's based on people's emotions are coming from what they think. The story that they tell themselves about whatever it is they're experiencing causes the emotions that then they feel. But if you change the story, you change the emotions. And sometimes the story is inaccurate. So the Jewish people and the spies told the wrong story about the information. But was there something in that day already that was a problem that was like a crack that, you know, like having tripped on a, on a crack in a sidewalk and gone flying doesn't take much to, to trip. If there's a crack in the system, there is a place to trip up. So here's a very interesting idea. We know there's 613 meets vote, right? And we divide them up almost always 248 positive meets vote that correspond to our limbs of our body, not according to any doctor you know, but our tradition, 248 parts of the body, and 365 negative commandments, prohibitions. So the 365, we usually don't talk about those because the 248 are actually more, usually more interesting. But what are those 365? So those 365 negative commandments are coordinated with for each day of the solar year, which means there's a one-for-one -one correspondence between a day of the year and one of the negative meets vote. I've never seen a list of all of those. I've seen some kind of list of some of the positive meets vote and how those compare to different parts of your body. But this is based on the understanding that Tisha B'Av, the ninth of Av, is connected to a very specific prohibition, one of, the, one of the 365 negative commandments. And that commandment is to not eat from the hind quarter, the sciatic nerve from the back of, the, of an animal, of a four-legged animal, it's that prohibition. So where does that prohibition come in? What, what was, how did we get that prohibition? Does anybody remember that? How did we get that prohibition not to eat from the Gid Hanashe? Yaakov and the angel. Yeah. Great. Yaakov was the in the battle with the angel of Esau, Esau, his twin brother, and he was injured in that. And so he was limping afterwards. That limping says, is, and because of that, we do not eat from the hind quarter. And that is a halacha for all time. So it's like, okay, that's interesting. So what does that mean? What does that actually mean that Yaakov was injured? It's like, what was that fight all about? What was Esau's angel trying to do to Yaakov? What was he trying to achieve? So you could say he was trying to kill him. So you could say that. He was just trying to kill him and trying to destroy him. But our relationship in this world with all sorts of things is much more complicated than a simple fight. It's never a simple fight. Like, it's not about borders, it's not about land, it's about existence. So things are much different. So let's take a look. Actually, you know what, I'm not sure if I have the page. Okay, we're just going to, we're just going to do it, as they say, outside. It specifically says that the angel, Esau's angel, injured um, Yaakov in his yerech. 
the yerech is the thigh, the upper thigh. Now, one hand, it says the thigh, which is like the bulk of the leg, is indicative of like what you stand on. It wasn't like he bent back his finger. It's not like he twisted his nose or pulled his hair. It's like his thigh. What is that? It's like the leg that is like this, the pillar upon which you stand. So it says, it wasn't just limping. Oh, he pulled, I pulled a muscle in my thigh when we had this battle. It's like, what was Yak, what was Aesop trying to do? He said he was trying to destroy and get rid of and damage the Yerech, the Yud, Resh, and Chaf, which is an acronym for three words. The three words are the Yud is for the word Yam. What does yam mean? The yam means the sea. We'll come back to it. The resh is for rakia, which means the heavens, like the sky, the heavens. And the chaf, with a as a ka rather than ha, is the kisei hakavod, the throne of glory. It says, does that do those three words trigger anything in a memory of you of? The sea, the heavens, the throne of glory. Does that trigger anything that you might remember of those three things being connected in some way? Does anybody remember? Etta. Is that Sinai? So, okay, so good guess. It's actually the Tehelet. It's the Tehelet, the thread of blue on the tzitzit. When it says you shall have a thread of blue and you shall look at it and remember all of the mitzvot. So what do our sages say about that blue? Why is it blue? It said it was blue to remind you that the, the color of the sea, because it's like a sea blue, blue sea, which looks like the blue sky, which should remind you of the throne of glory, which was also on the blue, uh, the, um, what's it called? Sapphire stones, the sapphire stones of God's throne. And it was a way of like, how do you remember that there is a God in heaven? Well, you'll see the sea, you'll look at the string and you'll think, oh, the string, that reminds me of the sea, that reminds me of the sky, which also reminds me of the, the throne of God. Because it's not always easy to think about the reality of God in our lives. So we need like this reminder course that helps us. So what was Asaph trying to do? He was trying to disconnect Yaakov, the Jewish people, from the relationship with God. How do you do that? You get them so they don't notice the sea, they don't notice the sky, and they don't disconnect from the Kisei HaKavod, the throne in heaven. What did he want to do? He injured that. But it says that he injured only the, it's the inside part of the thigh, the inner thigh, right? This is not my thigh. I can't get my leg up here. If this were my thigh, this part in here of my thigh, that's what he hurt. And it's called the cuff. Kind of like the cuff of your hand is the palm of your hand. The cuff of your foot is the sole of your foot. The cuff of your thigh is this internal thigh. But it's the letter cuff also says the only thing he damaged, really damaged, was the cuff of the yud Reish cuff. He damaged the connection to the kisei hakavo because that's what that cuff, 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 same, same letter just with the dot. He damaged that relationship. So that was the part that got a little bit wounded and handicapped. So that when we, and that set into motion, which is why we have a constant reminder. Otherwise, honestly, were there no people injured in any battles that the Jewish people had throughout history? We don't say, and we don't eat this because they were injured on that battle. And we don't eat this because they were injured here. We don't eat this because they were injured there. And we don't, we don't have this kind of global rejection of things that we do or don't do based on a, a battle, but specifically on that battle with that angel and that circumstance, because what was damaged was something that remains damaged. It remains, it's not a complete connection. We see the sea. I see the sky, but oh yeah, what? Oh, the Kisei HaKap, oh, oh right, Hashem is in this world. I'm not totally connected. When I lose that connection, that is the basis 
for all future tripping up. It's the trip that made tripping up that is led the spies to come back with a report like we can't do it. It's like, did you forget God and his promise? Yes. And then the people, did you forget forget what God did for you? How did you forget the Kisei Hakavo? How did you take God out of the picture? And the truth is, all of the sins that we have committed for the destruction of both those temples, the same thing. It says a person doesn't come to sin unless they are a little bit out of their minds. It's a little bit, it's called stuyot, like a little bit of stupidity. It's like, you think there's not a God in the world who sees what you're doing? What are you doing? You're telling yourself a story that isn't true. And therefore, you're going to fall into the trap. You think you're having this relationship and it doesn't matter. You think you're going involved with idolatry and you're worshiping something you made out of your own hands. What are you doing? You're murdering people thinking that you can take the life that you are God. What are you doing? You're speaking Lashon horror about people. You're ruining people's lives. What are you doing? It's all the same thing. So that in a way, Hashem has done us a favor by having all these tragedies on the same day because it makes it so crystal clear that they're all coming from the same problem. If you had tragedies that were drastic tragedies, but they were just peppered around the calendar, you think, oh, that's a coincidence. That's a coincidence. That doesn't mean anything. That doesn't mean anything. But when you go through Jewish history and you start stringing together all of the ninth of Avs in our history, if you're not paying attention to that, then you're really not paying attention. So it's like Hashem is giving us an opportunity to see, which is why he said the punishment was going to be, you're crying over nothing now. I'm going to give you something to cry for in the future so that you will see that this mistake you are making, you're making the same Kind of like in our own lives. Why do I keep making the same mistake? It's like the same song next verse. Why is my weakness showing up, you know, in the next relationship, in the next, whatever it is, like, why do I keep making the same mistake? It's because it's a fundamental mistake. And the Kisei HaKavu, the throne of glory, has been disconnected. We're limping. And once we're limping, it sets that up as a place. So right now in these nine days, we're limping. That, that fight with Esau's angel was on the Tisha B'Av. And everything that has happened since has been that same time. It's like, we need to fix it. We need physical therapy. So it's interesting. I had to go to physical therapy for my knees because it's so hilly in Mitzpah Yericho, where we live, that I actually don't get as much exercise because it's so, so hilly. So I don't go out. I It's hard to get out and walk around so much. So actually my knees have gotten weaker. So um, actually my knees didn't get weaker. The muscles in my legs have gotten weaker, which has caused pain in my knees. So when I went to the physical therapist, physical therapist said, your knees are fine. It's the muscles in your legs. And walking and all of this is meant to be, you are supposed to be with the muscles. And when the muscles aren't strong, then there's too much pressure on the tendons and that's causing your pain. So we don't need to do it. Your knees are fine, Baruch Hashem. You need to strengthen your leg muscles. They're like flexibility and this and strength things, which gave me all of these exercises to do. So we think the problem is one thing. My problem is I'm limping. And like, that's not the problem. The problem is that there's a fundamental flaw. The problem is that, you know, we we got kicked out of Spain. We got kicked out of France. We got all this. We have all these problems. Like, that's not the problem. That's the symptom. The problem is we have disconnected ourselves from the Yerach, from the Yam, from the sea, from the sky, and from the Kisei HaKavu. When we have the spiritual therapy and get ourselves strong again, we won't be limping, and Tisha B'Av will be strengthened, will stand, and it will become the holiday that it was meant to be. When it is the holiday that it's meant to be means that we fix the underlying problem. This is our goal. And we have these days, a few more days to really, really work on it. And when that happens, it says, Mashiach is born on Tisha B'Av. That the redemption can begin on Tisha B'Av. When we do the work that needs to be done. So what we're doing now is the spiritual, physical, the spiritual therapy to put this right. 
So when we go back to what we're dealing with now, which is primarily the spiritual therapy on the sinat chinam, or the baseless hatred of other people. And it says that this comes from not seeing people in their totality, judging them based on a few things that they have done or said, losing track of people's humanity. We're telling ourselves the wrong story. So our goal isn't like, I just need to learn to zip my mouth. That's not the problem. We wouldn't need to zip our mouths if we were thinking differently. If we were thinking differently, we would be speaking differently. So we are trying to have our hearts change. And that's the vision. So Tisha B'Av is the holiday and leading up to it is the holiday of to gain spiritual clarity. And spiritual clarity is not always happy. Sometimes, again, like going to the doctor, when they do the x-ray, the ultrasound, or the whatever, the results aren't always like, oh, that's great. It could be, you know, like when I went, like, you have a brain tumor. It's like, oh, I thought I had vertigo. Like, no, you have something else. You thought it was this, but it's really that. It's like the clarity that we have is like the clarity of an x-ray, of like what's really going on inside. So this is what we're trying to focus on during these nine days, and especially building up to Tisha B'Av, this is the avoda. This is the service that we have. We will be able to change then that echa. How is this possible that this happened? How is this possible that this has befallen the Jewish people? To a holiday, to 36 lights, 36 lights that illuminate the darkness and bring healing and health and joy and peace and happiness to the Jewish people. Then we will restore Av, the father, with his children, who's us. We are God's children. And that will be when that relationship is put back together again. Truly God willing, everybody, whatever it is that you can think of to do, do it. It can be small, it can be big, it just needs to be something. So again, going back, it says, instead of trying to think about and reading about what's Iran going to do, what's Hezbollah going to do, what are the Houthis going to do, is um, Pakistan going to join in? What about Russia? What about China? It's like, you know what? They're going to do what they do. Our bigger question is, but what am I going to do? So when I know what I'm going to do, that's the impact I have. There are a lot of Jewish people and our spiritual light is magnified. The presence of the Jewish people is magnified in this world for better or for worse. The world thinks that we're running the world. The world is more concerned with us than any other situation on the planet. And they're not wrong to not fo to focus on us. They're not wrong. They've just got it turned around. So the things that we do have tremendous impact on the spiritual system. And our goal is to literally suck the life out of evil and bring more life to the side of good. And it is really as simple but not easy as that. The evil in this world is being nurtured by spiritual energy. Things cannot exist if there's no spiritual energy for them. How do we draw it to the other way? It's like we have to siphon it off. It's like we siphon it off by like creating a vacuum, like suctioning it out. And that's through increasing our spiritual light, pulls the energy and deflates the other side. It's kind of a simple metaphor, but that's what it is. That's what we're working with. So the job is in our hands. It's very interesting being in Israel. People like, we went to the aquarium yesterday, had a picnic lunch with our kids and grandchildren. The stores are busy, the cafes are busy, the beach is busy. It's like, so what do you do to get ready for a possible multi-front war? I don't know, you don't give them the pleasure of watching us be terrorized. They said that part of the terror that they're trying to do is the waiting and the uncertainty, that that's intentional to make us wait because that is so distressing to human beings of waiting for something to happen. So. It's almost a little bit dafka, like we're not going to let you get to us. So this doesn't mean that 
people are not struggling because people are really struggling. But at the same time, people are also living their lives, having their vacations and doing as much as they can to be as normal as possible. And I can tell you one thing, the davening last um, Shabbos, Arab Shabbos, because we didn't know if the attack was coming then or not, was you could feel it. Every word was said with such incredible intensity. It's always, the music is always beautiful, but people were so focused, you could feel it. So there's something to be said about having very focused experiences and knowing exactly what you should be doing. So this is what we're doing. We, the Jewish people, always have an approach to everything. We don't have moments of silence. We don't have despair. And we're not supposed to have excessive fear. It says we are supposed to do something. And what we're supposed to do is very clearly laid out for us. Teshuva, tefila, sadaka. Returning to our true selves, prayer, tehillim, psalms, all of that, and also expressions of gratitude. Each day, I tell you, each day when we wake up, it's like, okay, we had another night that was, I mean, not, not in the north and not in the south, but to be grateful for what we have, to express gratitude. So expressing gratitude is not um, contrary to also asking God to save us, but it comes along with expressing gratitude for all the blessings that we have as well. And I have to say the stores, uh, the, the repeat the de deflating idea. Yes. Think of a closed system of spiritual energy with two sides, the side of good and the side of evil, which side gets the energy. The one that is like the Jewish people are in control of that. When we are diminished in our spiritual level, it sends the energy to the side, the, the side of negativity and evil. When we increase our spirituality, it's just like it just changes. It's a seesaw relationship. This was laid out in a prophecy to Rebecca when she was pregnant with Jacob and Esau. And she was told, and the might shall pass from one to the other. That's how it's going to be. This isn't anything you can reconcile. This is good and evil. And our increasing our good pulls the energy away from the side of evil. And that is our strategy. Again, this doesn't rule out military or anything else, but it won't be effective without, because in the end, this is a spiritual battle. It is a spiritual battle. And we're seeing it play out right in front of our very eyes. So that's that's what we're doing. So God willing, we will be successful. Hashem will send incredible miracles. I already read that that Iran is reconsidering attacking. So I don't know exactly what that means. Um, and we have Hezbollah, which is quite a lot to be thinking about. But you know what? After we're going to make Shabbos meals and just go about our business. And I know the tension is going to increase um, next week as we get closer to Tisha B'Av. And people, people tend to stay, keep a pretty low profile on Tisha B'Av anyway, because it's that kind of a day. So increasing our, our prayers and our actions and our mitzvot and everything that we can do to shift that energy is where we want to be in this equation. So, And we're all connected. It has nothing to do with whether in the land of Israel or not. The Jewish people are all connected. So... God willing, we will, by the time we meet next week, Bezrat Hashem, God willing, we will have a, yes, we are exactly one body. We are called Adam. We are one person. So it's nice to see all the different parts of my body all looking great. So we want it to be healthy and no limping. So we're going to get to the bottom of this and fix that day so that we are completely healed. All right, ladies. Have a meaningful fast. I don't think people are going to have difficulty connecting this year to Tisha B'Av. Um, we, have, we have our work to do, and hopefully we will all be successful, and Hashem will see how great we are. And the Jewish people are great. I just want to end with that. I was at a class the other night, and someone said, yes, we have work to do, but can we just take a moment and say how amazing the Jewish people are? Let's just for a moment say, 
We haven't had the Beit HaMikdash for a couple thousand years. We haven't had prophets. We've had challenging leadership. We've been spread around the globe. We have been, every form of persecution that man has come up with has been thrown at us. It is miraculous and nobody's for is forcing us to do anything. There's no military police that is policing Jewish people. Everyone who is participating is doing it voluntarily. And, and it's, and can you believe that we are at such an incredible level that there are people learning Torah, observing as many mitzvot as they can, connecting to their communities, supporting Torah, learning. We are amazing. So there's that too. So we want to uh, recognize that as well. And for the people who are not coping as well, it's like, you know what? We've been through a lot. Not everybody can cope and whatever we can do to help other people along, we should do. So God willing, Hashem will, yes, making Aliyah is great, but whatever somebody is doing is, uh, is good um, from wherever you are. As we said, prayers, mitzvot, we're all connected. We have a joint account a joint account and everybody's deposit matters and everybody's withdrawal matters. So keep the deposits coming in. Those shekels and pennies add up. All right, ladies, have a meaningful Shabbos. May we all see a vision of the Beit HaMikdash on Shabbat Chazon and really visualize what we are missing, but also what can be and what is within reach um, with God willing very soon. Have a wonderful, wonderful Shabbos. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Ellen, you have one minute? Yes. Thank you. Um, I'm so sorry. I went to the doctor and it took double the time, an hour. I never thought he would give me an hour. So I missed 35 minutes. was terrible because the 9th of Av, first of all, I've already started yesterday. I've started already. Yeah. Was, yes, we're already into it because, um, yeah. yes. Yeah. We are starting on Monday. <clears throat> okay, so I already had chicken last night, so I already seems, but the rest has to be fish? Is that a tradition or a... Um, anything, or a anything other than meat. And <clears throat> right, other... but I, I didn't, on the plane, like coming back from Chile, they didn't announce it the first of Av, and I didn't have a calendar with me. So I messed up, but I will not mess up more.